Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift for the Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race 2023. The men's race, 174 k's long from Geelong to Geelong. They go out along the coast through Barnheads to Torquay, then back inland. Uh, yeah, pretty sure. And then do four reps of a hilly circuit, which has the Chalumbra Crescent. 900 meters at 9 percent descent and then they go through this narrow bridge uh before doing the melville climb uh which i still think could have been a should have been used more as a launch pad across both races 600 meters 8.3 percent particularly with the narrowing into it uh and it has a steep section in it too but anyway it's named after cadell he was back in town uh, not every World Tour team has to do this race, so you don't see Group Arm FDJ here, Yumbo Visma, they went home. Uh, that's why Bolton Equities have been invited, um, but no Bridge Lane men's team. Ah, a Conti team's... Hold on, hold on, hold on. A Bolton on, Pro Conti now? Yes, Bolton is a, a Pro Conti team now, uh, and I think... Um, Maybe the reasoning is that the Conti teams can't ride this race because it's a level too high or something, but I'm not 100% certain. That must be it. And we see riders that are in Conti teams in the UniSA Australia team because the Australian national team has the chance of offering a few positions to uh, non welter riders or welter riders that don't have their team here to join. Uh, for example, Caleb Ewing, not a welter rider, but he's at a lot of destiny now i was gonna say suit out oof i'm still not used to the names and uh that's why he's in the australian team and still here at this race but hey um yeah no conti teams what else that rule that must be the rule because yeah tour de swiss has the swiss team but no conti teams only pro conti teams so that's why there's no bridge lane which is a shame but i guess that's the incentive to move up to pro conti anyway UAE had a really strong team here with punchers, but no out-and-out sprinter like Jayco have uh, Michael Matthews, for example. Bora have Marco Haller. Sudal Quickstep were kind of similar with punchy riders. But yeah, they had the TDU winner, plus he or she was strong on corkscrew. So we think mm, they're a good candidate to be aggressive. But taco time, Benji. Early in the season, <laughs> taco time. I hope he finished the race, but he was on a big solo mission. Exactly. He tried to attack with some other dude, Lebede or something, but Lebede was not at the level of Taco because Taco got away and Lebede did not. So Taco just um, just Takoed away. <laughs> That's how we describe it. He's now a verb already. And um, he, he had a large gap for most of the race, like five minutes, whatever. Uh, but Jacob was uh, controlling in the peloton. I'm not sure if UAE was also pacing in the earlier parts of the race, but the first real action happened on the Chalambra Crescent. Haha, the pronunciation is goated right now. I've, <laughs> I'm basically Australian at this point, mate. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Shrewd Bucks was pacing for UAE on the climb. Um, and it didn't look like the craziest tempo, but it was a solid tempo that some people in the group are already getting hurt. But it wasn't the last move on the climb either, because I think we saw Yannick Steimler going in the second half of the of the climb, trying to actually make a difference there. And there was no real split on that climb, I'd say. There were like some gaps of like five meters, but that gets closed on top once again, because nobody really took initiative except two riders at the top that tried to ride away. Jonas Ruch and uh, Kostiu from Arkea, who rode away in the descent, and were basically hanging in between Taco and the peloton at that point. And... What do you think the strategy was on that climb from UAE? Just setting tempo and attritioning the competitors? Yeah, I think UAE were trying to use... You've only got four Chalambras. It's not like that hard. It's not that long a climb when you compare it to like a Trofeo La Guelia race, for example. Um, and there is that flat run into the finish. So they got to make everyone count to put bling under pressure to make maybe Hindley and Yates react earlier than they want to to get rid of Caleb Ewan who was here uh the probably the yep. fastest rider on paper if the race was super easy so I thought that was their plan I assumed um yeah like they that's what they were doing because then when you know Ruch and Kosciu went they're like eh, don't care uh we'll wait for the next Chalambra and they just I think it might have been Vink 
then pacing in between the Chalambras yeah. between fourth and third, a last one. But yeah, they kept showing Taco, so we don't know for sure what happened on the second Chalambra, but <laughs> you look into my crystal ball, I'm going to guess UAE paced it pretty hard because all of a sudden we see Taco go over the KOM and UAE just pinning it with uh, three Stavenines who won this race. I think his only World Tour win, maybe. Uh, I'm probably wrong. He probably won a race that was World Tour level pre-World Tour being created in like 2009. He won this race ahead of Sivakov. He was there with George Bennett, Elliot Schultz from the Oz national team. Um, should have been taken to the TDU. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Aussie riders, you know, deserving a contract. I would say he's not had a chance in World Tour and he's good. Yeah. He's young and punchy, good for a lot of different races. It could be valuable. And I think he was actually valuable today. So, I'd like to see him get a chance. But anyway, he was there with Heider, Hamilton, Fisher Black, who looks strong, Rooch, and Hindley, as well as Plapp. So no Vine, no he or she. What do you think UAE's plan there was, Benji? Because this group kind of, it just existed for a while, not knowing what really to do. I think Dinham and Hamilton might have been there too. I think it's some kind of situation that they're trying to create where they have multiple riders of the road, but... The thing is, if you have this group up the road, then I don't necessarily think that George Bennett and Fisher Black are the strongest in that group. So they're kind of putting themselves in a situation where if this group actually makes it, then it might become troublesome for UAE. So despite them making the race active and therefore making it harder for the Ewans of the world and the Peloton, I don't think this group was necessarily the best means to an end to an actually victory on their end. So I guess it's just the, the only positive that really came out of it was a bit of a harder race for the peloton who had to keep chasing that group. And that group ended up catching Taco. We already had uh, Kostiu and Ruch caught, as Ruch was basically part of that G2 uh, that you just mentioned, the, the one that included Plapp, O'Brien, David Nance, and so forth. And we saw continuous attacks from UAE afterwards because they were not happy with that situation, as in that group up the road is not ideal, huh? So they're thinking Fisher Black goes, rolls attack. And then we see a, a roll of an attack by George Bennett, I think. I think mostly Fisher Black, mostly by the way. Fisher Black, yeah. Yeah. So I and think Dinan they were was riding really negative. Happy. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is he doing? He, he's, look, he's pretty strong. Dinam knew Neo Pro I was like, he's closing down every move, riding really negative, and, but strong. He looks like he's strong enough to go on with it. And maybe, maybe he just couldn't. Or maybe they were running for Meyerhofer, a quick finisher, <laughs> behind, and they were shutting it down, him and well, Hamilton. I will say at that point in the race, I would have found it a bit crazy to go all out for Meyerhofer already. No? Yeah, and now I'm thinking, I swear Hamilton started rotating with that group on the flat too later. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, okay, that was my theory. But Dinham looks like he's already <laughs> pretty solid. Um but yeah, he, I think if he'd gone with Fisher Black instead of letting wheels go, I think they could have also counted ahead. And I, I was thinking at this point, UAE, genius tactics. Because you were using Fisher Black, who's been he's really strong. He broke the Shalambra KOM during the week. Mm. They're making Hindley counter. They're making Simon Yates work. So yeah. I'm thinking when Jay Vine nukes it last Chalambra, who would be most likely to be on his wheel from TDU? Hinley, Yates, O'Connor. Except Hinley and Yates have just been mucking around chasing 68, 70 kilo Finn Fisher Black doing 500 watts on the flat. And so Vine's going to get separation. That's what I thought that was. So I thought great tactics. Um, but yeah, before we move into the next phase of the race, Swift. 1.33 update is here. A new world is added. Scotland, make sure you follow Zwift on Twitter or Instagram to find out more news about the Scotland world. In February, there'll be more details released, so stay tuned for that. It will be event only in February, but also holo replays will now be recorded and spawn for complete routes in addition to just segments, and they'll wait for riders at the beginning 
of segments. So that feature, which is one of my personal favorites, yeah, will be is continually being improved. And yeah, also go to the Swift forum as well at Swift uh, on Swift.com. So to find out more information about Swift. Next phase of the race, it gets brought back Benji because it just kept counterattacking. Chalambra three. Word, 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 word. Oh, there's something else happening. Erasure. <laughs> Elliot Schultz once again in the attack with Dries Davenens before that Chalambra Crescent tree, and then Thank they you. get caught. Okay, Thank I just you. wanted to add that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're allowed to interject when it's praising Australians. Otherwise, it's obviously <laughs> forbidden. <laughs> and a Belgian, Davenens. <laughs> oh, true, yeah. By the way, <laughs> it's actually what does that matter? Is he mean? decent again this year? David Ines? Three seven Ines. I don't know. It depends. He's good today? Has Lefebvre been mean to him? <laughs> no, only to the guy that he's leaning out. <laughs> Hello, Philippe. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> he looks like he's good enough to do the sort of lead outs he was doing for Jala in 2021. Yeah. So, yeah, he looks fine. I mean, again, January race, but still... He did well in 2020 Cadells and then was good in 2020, 2021. Uh, but yeah, sorry for the erasure of the the young and old Belgian Australian. Anyway, comes back together. Chalambra, second last Chalambra, 27 Ks to go. Tovi attacks. Again, I'm like, great strats from UAE. Tovi is, I mean, actually, he's quite fast, but uh, him going clear, maybe he gets in a group with the Schmidt or someone like that and then he can sit on and finesse later if not it also forces again Hindley, Yates, O'Connor, Plap to chase and on Plap Benji friend of the podcast yes sir I feel like Plap could have won this race I feel like he was strong enough Ooh. but I couldn't okay. tell and I couldn't tell in TDU either and I'm going to ask him hopefully this week was he riding 50% for himself, 50% for Heidegg and Hater behind? Was he riding just for himself? Or was he riding? Like, I can't figure it out, um, his plan. Yeah. I think um, when it comes to Tour Down it was also weird, as in him going for the KOM points. I never really got the gist of it. Maybe it's just, I want to be on the podium for a few days. Maybe that's the as a part there. But we expect Flap to go f- aim a bit higher than that. At least that's what I expected. So going into this race, Catalan's Great Ocean Road Race, we saw him move into the attacks and try and move into moves, but not necessarily make the moves initially at this point in the race. Like he's following this Covey attack, for example, and he's not necessarily going past Covey and trying to split it up to make sure that he's in a group ahead either. So it's kind of like it's kind of like playing double cards. If you can go in a group to make the situation for Ineos better good but if you can just close the gap so that it's neutralized for hater also good right that's how i feel about it i think so i would i mean i would like to see the team just give him a full lead out into the base of one of these climbs and see what he can do um but yeah that again i think platt was pretty strong today uh but anyway kovi got brought back i think uae it's all looking good they then get, though, over the crest. Vine was sitting six wheel following. Kovi gets closed by the top, pretty much. Caleb Ewan's there. And then Vine starts rolling attacks sort of on the flat. And this is where they lost me a little bit. Yeah. I was like, I thought they were just going to rinse and repeat then. They flogged everyone's legs. legs. Um, and then... I don't know who was attacking Benji. I think it might have been on Melville or it was in the in-between sections. But yeah, Vine attacked twice. One yep. time there was another guy coming from behind and they sort of, he checked his attack and Vine went, Hindley? went on the attack. I'm not sure. No, there was a UAE remember. guy attacking oh. and then he stopped because Vine was attacking. Oh, I've got no clue who that was, but I, I, I did see that. It was like going on into that very narrow bridge that... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway, that UAE rider went on the right and then Vine went on the left and they, the one guy stopped anyway. Um, yeah, I agree with that, but it's kind of like when we talk about the cobbles in Paris-Roubaix, we talk about, oh, you got to try and attack a Vanderpool in between the cobble sections because if you attack him on the cobble sections, you're going to get 
destroyed. And if you attack him outside of the cobble sections, he's going to have to respond to every single attack. So that makes it harder. Is there a factor like that here? Like they're trying Isn't to Vine attack Vanderpool? Yates in between the hills? But Vine's Vanderpool maybe, in the yeah, analogy. Maybe they see Yates as Vanderpool. I mean, I don't see it that way. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I like I. I would have maybe they just listen. Vine won TDU. It's a long trip out. He or she and the others rode for Vine at TDU for the most part. Today was he or she's day. That yep. also explains it, and that Vine was softening everyone up. Nah. To to go for he or she. That's how I. I see don't it. believe it. I feel like it's more free for all thing where they tried with multiple riders and saw what they got, but not necessarily had an all-out plan to launch one rider at the end. How mm. I felt about it. I think you're probably right too. And anyway, it comes back together. Caleb Ewan's holding on. Australian national team around him. Drizness moves him up. We're all pretty much together in a pretty large group um, by the last Chalambra. And UAE launch. Well, Sherd Bax goes first wheel in and he or she loses his wheel. And I thought, oh, he or she's going to let him go as a reverse lead out, but he or she does actually a big effort closing backs. Remember backs all the way back at first Chalambra push the pace there. All the way backs. All the way backs. Jesus. Um, <laughs> and so he, he's not going to be able to do full Chalambra lead out. And I thought, holy shit is, is I thought 2020 he or she was back. You could say that backs fell a bit short. <laughs> he did. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Was there any moment where you thought 2020 here she's about to step off backs and just nuke no. everyone off the wheel? No? no. <laughs> not, not oh, single I did. Second, mate. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I th- I thought, ooh, the age 2020, he about to just step off backs, man. It doesn't matter that it's 200 meters into the club. I thought he was going to do it. I don't know. And then she's like, nah, what's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't believe in it. I didn't believe in it. Like <laughs> it wasn't even Hirschi that launched it properly. It was Dries David Ends that was back again. <laughs> yeah. David Ends once again launching on the Chalambra Crescent. Pronunciations keep it up. Amazing. But um Hirschi closes that and then is the the legend himself. I announced him. Sven Erik fucking Bistrom arrives. He's in the wheel of Hirschi and he goes over them. And he absolutely destroys everybody on the climb, <laughs> as in he gets a gap of 20 meters. And it's a um, gap. Yeah, a very pretty good gap. <laughs> and by the top, the 20 meters are not really being chased down because people are like, oh, staring at each other. It's only Bistre and people. Huh? Who's going to chase? I don't really feel like it. But it's <laughs> fucking Bistre. He's been close <laughs> in the Santa Student Under. Two top fives on the green stages, if we can call them in the Santa Student Under. And. He's really, let's be honest about it, challenge Mallorca races, January Holsons exist, January Bistrim is a fucking thing. So <laughs> Benji talking about this guy like he's Alessandro <laughs> Balan regen. <laughs> Journeyman And then Mystique. Schmidt attacked and closed them down. Um, and then they continued. They had a gap. It was impressive. Hey, 15 seconds, 10 seconds, 11 seconds. Mauro Schmidt, Sven Erik Bistrim. And um, yeah, the race wasn't over yet because we had two teams spacing in the group behind me and one of them you're not very happy about. Well, Schmidt and Bistrom is a really strong pairing. That's why they're such useful riders because they're about 70 kilos plus. And so if they can get over those climbs and then they start cooperating on the flat, they're really strong. They're doing big numbers to bring back. They get down the descent quickly. So yeah, I was like, Schmidt and Bistrom aren't coming back because you and He's in the group behind, and he also moved up to the front, which I don't think was a wise idea. I would have hit anonymously at the back on the descent if I was Ewan. Because... Even Hater style. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> was he, he, I think Hater was there. Um, yeah. And yeah, Israel had Seb Berwick, who had been there in the group, but I think it was mainly age to our pacing. Like The chase was... People did a bit of this, a bit of that. Quick step with second wheel blocking. Yeah. I think Intermarche could have done a little bit of a better job blocking, but they were actually conserving riders for the sprint. And yeah, age to our pacing. I yeah, I'm not 
I'm not a big fan of it. Jayco pacing as well. Um, for Bling in the sprint, I again, like, well, if you they... chase the group down, yeah. you're more likely to get a podium, right? But yeah. you're also likely to get a podium if you let Kel go in a move with Plap. Are you not? Same with EF. Yeah, but what can Ajazer do here? That's my view. Because, like, I mean, to say is like a rider that can top five the sprint here. O'Connor, at that point in the race, can't do anything anymore, right? Or do you expect him to also be able to make that move like a Kellen O'Brien or whatever? Were they going for Godot in the sprint? Good or, Tuzé. or, or Tuzé. well, Tuze was meant to be the guy, but then he hit the floor. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, yeah, they're going for Tuze. I mean, if they don't pace, they get nothing out of it. But yeah, if I, I probably wouldn't have been me to take it up. But yeah, I, I was surprised. EF had four riders and didn't weren't aggressive when there's quicker guys yeah. in the group. And you know, Ugo Page is quick too. And so Antomache, perfect tactics as well. So they, they played it really, really well. Anyway, the gap eventually gets brought back. I thought they were going to stay away, but Platt bursts out of the group, which has Hater in it. Uh, I don't know if he was just doing a hard lead out, but I thought Platt was going to go around them and win, like Laporte style. And yeah. he's then brought back by, I think, Jayco. Big yeah. crash Matthews. or crash on the barriers. Pun. Matthews himself was the one closing. Flat really? towards the end of the of, of his move because we're we're going into the last 250 meters. But I want to throw it back to 400 meters to go for a second. We see that two riders that were ahead, Bistrom and Schmidt. Bistrom was keeping up the tempo. Did Schmidt stop too early or yep. was it lost at that point? No, he stopped too early. I still think they don't win. But yep. he definitely, there was no time for finessing. Because you see him, he quickly got in the drop, started sprinting into the group because he had something well, maybe a little bit left. So I, I think, wasn't he in the group? He was in the group that got caught in, in the sprint for second at Worlds. Yeah, he was. And I want to add for a second, while Tuzé was the one that crashed at the barrier, so the Ajde Zer sprinter next to Godon, they had two options there. There was another crash in the group, which was in the middle of the group, which it looked like it was O'Connor that like moved a bit to the right, didn't crash, but Ethan Hater lost control and hit the floor. So Ethan Hater crashed during this during this final, so Plap was at that point the only chance for Ineos to get anything out of this. But I'll throw it back to you for the uh, final ultimate sprint and surprise winner. Messi sprint. Marius Meyerhofer jumps clear for DSM. They'd been they'd had numbers ahead with Hamilton and Denham pretty much in all the important moves, and he wins. He flirted with, I don't know, they were riding with him at Santos Tour Down Under on a couple of stages where he came top 10. He came fifth in the Schwalbe Classic crit and now wins his first race since his junior days, he said. He was very emotional after the finish. His best result in the pros was probably a sprint at Settimana in 2021, the opening stage, where he came third behind Moreczko and Cavendish. But this is a whole much much harder race than that 22 years old in a contract year uh i guess unfortunately for dsm and ugo (laughs) page second simon clark third for israel matthews fourth strong fifth so israel third and fifth i'll touch on that with you in a second you and sixth he was in bad position for the sprint and then sort of didn't have the legs smith seventh for antemarche so antemarche also with second and seventh seventh and then here she eighth ben at ninth uh for uae so three teams with riders in the top 10 uh which is a little bit curious are israel going for points already maybe i think there's a possibility there because they well they do need to get it on a yearly basis compared to other teams other teams need to get it on a three-year basis in that triennium or whatever you call it these days but Israel needs to score in this year to make sure they get that top two spot in the pro team classification to get the wild cards that they want next year again. So it wouldn't shock me if they think about UCI points already, but would it have changed a thing? Let's say if you look at those two riders going into the sprint, on paper you'd say, oh, Clark would lead out strong because on paper strong is the stronger flat sprinter. 
but Clark's also fast, and Clark beats Strong in the end. So, I don't know. What situation would you have created if you like had one work for the other? Would you have uh, had a decent lead out? Might have had, to be honest. I think I think you have a better chance with a lead out. Same with Page and Dion Smith. Uh, yeah. Maybe I haven't seen the overhead, so maybe there was a lead out from Smith. But I, I do think you have a better chance when you have another guy bring you up at speed to yeah. beat someone like Myhoff. Myhoff was strong, but yeah. Um, maybe Antomache are also going for points uh, at this point. But they, you know, good day for DSM. They win. And Wells had also won in San Juan, beating Jakobsen in Venice. So a double day, double victory day for DSM, starting the season off well. Antomache also flying. Hobart Holsen's won two of those Mallorcan races. Um, so they're doing really, really well. I am re- careful to overstate January results. We remember last year, the Lotto Sedal <laughs> victory lap after January and Wait. Feb races. Yeah. So. We are saying don't overrate general results, but when Vine wins Santa Sonana, we're like, well, Giro GC, co leader Almeida. Or is that, that's different, right? That has nothing to do with diff- TDU. Because Vuelta. Yeah. And the time it's- trial confirmation. The Vine thing is really simple. There's not much thinking that needs to go into whether a guy's a grand tour contender. Guy did 6.5 for 30 in a grand tour stage. Guy won national championships TT. So he's going to try and contend GC at a grand tour. That's just so how it is. The reason that Mark Bodden isn't GC leader at a grand tour is because he hasn't won the Ukrainian time trial championships yet. I think he might have won it. Has he? Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Did um, I find a flaw in the logic? <laughs> no, there's no flaw in the logic. If you no, can find a rider who did 6.5 for 30 in race and yeah. did that performance on a TT bike and didn't go to a Grand Tour to contest GC, and I'll retract it. But there's, riders will always... Yeah. Unless they have to ride for Froome or something like Port, um, but <laughs> Joe well, he has gone for GC. I made a Froome in 2014, at least not yet. Uh, anyway, a good race, some interesting tactics. Um, do you think who out of this group, the young guys, Benji, Meyerhofer, Page, Strong, are they all legit? I think Page is well, the one I'm most confident in. I think so as well. I think Hugo Page is the rider that I just expect to slap Coupe de France races, like those one one French races for Intermarché, I expect him to do well at. But he's also done decent in like the sprints at Dauphiné uh, last year where he got relatively close. So maybe he can rack up a World Tour race or get close to it once again because he's close to it already on this one, for example. But Corbin Strong, I also feel like I'm confident in he needs to step up a tiny bit, though. There's some tweaks that need to be happening uh, for him. Like Mauro Schmid, who said it 10,000 times, uh, that guy's going to break through at, at some point. Because, like, top five Montreal last year, that was the, the result that really brought it forward for me as well. And I expect him in the Cobble Classics to be a valuable asset for Sudal Quickstep. And there's plenty of young riders in that group. Eh? We're looking at the very young Caleb Ewan, what's up for his positioning today? Or do you think it was the consecutive climbs that did it? I don't know. I mean, he was on Thomas' podcast and he said, you know, <laughs> all the B-tier sprinters keep getting in his way in the sprints. They're, they're not, they're, you know, taking the wheel away. Um, I guess that means Meyerhofer and Page are A-tier sprinters. I don't know. Um, it could be that. I, as I said, I haven't seen the overhead shot yet. Um, <laughs> but listen, it's tough to criticize Ewan for not winning the sprint when, to be honest, I expected him to get dropped. <laughs> so he's done better than expected to make that group in quite an open, aggressive race. And, you know, he didn't have a lead out really in the final either. So I think Poggio Ewan could be back. I wouldn't be surprised to see Poggio Ewan. Um, yeah. Return for Milano San Remo. Whether a group will work with him, I don't know. Um, I doubt it. But got some hey. points. Second place is always available. Eh? 
Yeah, Mara Schmidt maybe is going to go oh. clear. It's possible. Could be. He could, uh, well, go clear, I don't know. I feel like Alaphilippe's still the, the punchy rider that they'll send, even though like Mallorca challenges weren't great for him, but I feel like Alaphilippe will still be <laughs> great at the races he peaks for. Um, but outside of that, I forgot to uh, highlight the special performance by Sven Erik Bistrom. I do expect that that will fade into uh, in existence in a tiny bit. I don't expect that Bistrom to keep this up. He's got like this one or two weeks every single year that he's amazing when it comes to his own results. Maybe the fact that he doesn't have to ride for Kristoff changes things. Um, I don't know about that. We'll see. I do think he might be closing like uh, an omelope. I expect Bistrom to top 15 omelope. I was going to say top 10, but they're probably going to go for Binyam, no? Or Turnison. Yeah. I think so. This so, is a useless he prediction. Have a sprint. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, if you don't have a sprint, it's just so tough in life. That's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, you're walking down the street. Yeah, loads of trouble in my life. <laughs> you're walking down the street, don't have 1,400 watts under the bonnet. <laughs> it's just tough out there. Miss so, my bus as a consequence. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you got to have it there, ten second peak. Um, but yeah, we'll see. He, I think he'll be a lovely points farmer for them this year. Um, he'll score lots and lots of points. Same thing with sort of Schmidt. It's like, does he really have that sprint? I'm not convinced in race. You no, know, I'm not convinced. What I know for certain is that the second this podcast ends, I will have my sprint back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll round. We'll wrap it up. The Australian Summer of Cycling with UCI races is over. Benji's he, he's lasted a good month, but he's reached his limits. This is how it feels for the couch peloton and Australian fans for eight months. The rest of the eight months of the long cycling year. Hope you enjoyed the pod, and we'll be back with a San Juan roundup uh, this week sometime. Until then, ciao. <laughs>